Good morning, and I welcome all to worship this morning on July the 19th. I pray that you hear that the Lord loves you and knows you all by name. Our opening scripture comes from Romans 8. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Let us join together in a call to worship. Like Jacob dreamed of a ladder reaching to heaven, so we dream of you, O God, and reach toward you to find that you are already reaching towards us. In Jacob's dream, the Lord spoke, Know that I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go. We know that you are with us, O Lord, and keep us wherever we go. When Jacob woke, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Surely you are present in this place, O God. Help us to know and believe. Let us worship God together. Let us join together in prayer. Lord, you are with us when we sense your presence and when it feels as if you are far away. You are with us when we are alone and when we gather together as believers in Christ. You are with us, Lord, and we lift our voices to you in gratitude and in praise. Amen. In Psalm 139, we read, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. Let us join together in confession. Lord, you are acquainted with all of our ways. You know us completely. Hear us as we approach you honestly in confession. You know that at times we try but fail to live up to your desire for us. You know that at times we don't even try. Forgive us, O God, for, for thoughts that displease you. Forgive us, O God, for spoken words that do, don't honor you. Forgive us, O God, when we walk down a path that we later regret. Forgive us, we pray, and hear us, Lord, as we confess to you in silence as something we have tried to hide from you. Friends, God created us. God knows us and understands us completely. So hear and accept the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us return again to prayer. Holy God, be with us as we turn our focus to hear of your word and how it would speak to us each of our lives. May you quiet the parts of our heart that call us away and tune our minds to the listening and to the understanding. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Our first reading comes from Romans 8, verses 12 through 25. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. But you do not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and of children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time 
are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing to the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope of the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to the decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves. We have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies, for in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Our second reading continues our time in the Gospel of Matthew, the 13th chapter. This time, verses 24 through 30, and again 36 through 43. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the time of harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom, the weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of this age, and the reapers are angels. So just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where they'll be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the Son of the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Okay, so we're all familiar with weeds. We're familiar with weeds in our gardens, in our lawns, and many of us in our fields. And where we have weeds, our natural tendency is to go weeding and to rip them out. That is to take that offending plant from the ground as fast as possible. Yet our passage seems to be telling us that we should be leaving the weeds alone. What gives? So let's try to understand this parable a little bit more. Jesus is equating the kingdom of God to a wheat field that has weeds in it. That is to say that there are helpful plants and there are harmful plants. Now, who of us have not seen very real weeds in the world? Weeds that will attempt to choke out the other plants. And that good and bad exist in the kingdom, that is the world. And often good and bad exist side by side. So thinking of weeds in the garden, this makes me think on some of the other tendencies that I have to get involved. 
And I quickly realize that one of the hardest things for me to do is in fact nothing. It seems to go against my nature, for I am a tinkerer. I like to fix things. Well, fix. That is, I like to take things apart and most of the time try to put them back together again. I have yet to meet a house, a car, or a computer that I was happy with the way that it came to me. I like to paint houses, I like to upgrade computers, and I like to modify cars. Right now I have a year old car that I just recently pulled all apart and took apart the back end just to install a hitch. Now, do I need a hitch? Not right now, not at this moment. But I like adding the functionality. I like the new possibilities. And who knows what I might need in the future. As said, I am a tinkerer. Perhaps this is why I have such a real problem with this gospel reading this week. That is to leave things alone. Or to say it another way, that it's not my place to fix everything. Does this rub anyone else the wrong way also? I'm going to guess many of you also like to fix things. You might be a tinkerer like me, or perhaps you're a school teacher, or a craftsman, or a caseworker. In all of these cases and so many more, we are accustomed to fixing things, improving situations, and as such, we are like the servants in today's reading, chomping at the bit to pull out the offending weeds and to fix the field. And if it's hard to not take things apart and fix things, I know it's only that much harder to resist the urge to take things apart and fix them when they are really important like the church itself. Again, like the parables in today's reading, it can be very tempting to want to fix the church by cleaning house and rooting out all the bad apples. Yet that is not what God is calling us to do. Reading again from the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. So again, the message is for us to leave the weeds alone. Huh. Leave the weeds alone. I think that we have to be very honest with ourselves that this is a very unusual response and has such a very uncomfortable one compared to our natural tendencies. For our natural desire is again to root that weed out. As such, we want to ask why. Why doesn't God want us to follow through on our desire to have a weed-free garden? Or even better yet, a weed-free church? Think about how much more productive the garden could be if there were no weeds in it. Or better yet, think about how much more productive we could be if everyone agreed and got along in the church. And that is often what we're looking for, somehow all agreeing. And when we are labeling each other as wheat and weeds, it's whether or not the other person is agreeing with us at a given moment on any issue of the day. We unfortunately are deciding the goodness or the wrongness of a person that is their status as weeds or wheat, as you will, just by stating our opinion 
on a current situation rather than their true status. My apologies, friends. For example, there's the age-old separation between liberal and conservative politics. And being on the right side or the wrong side of that might yield someone in our minds weed or wheat, but that has no bearing on their true personality. Or in the recent case of supporting the police or supporting the protesters, depending on someone's position, we might be tempted to call them weeds or wheat. But again, that is only the current politic, not their ultimate location. Or maybe even something very important like Chevy versus Ford. But whatever they are, friends, these are our opinions, and they are not indicative of what the true soul is of the person. So God doesn't want us to go tearing out the weeds in the kingdom, because unlike the garden or the field, and in these cases the weeds are people, we're going to be throwing out people And that is a terrible thing to be doing as one person to another. For remember, we are called not to judge. And that includes who among us is weeds and who is wheat. Now, unfortunately, as the enemy in the passage knows, that weeds and wheat can look a lot alike at times. And the only way to really know the difference is to wait for the final harvest. And it is only then that we can tell the two apart. As such, again, we must not judge, for it can be hard to uproot the weeds without making a mistake and unearth unearthing the wheat at the same time. For who among us can do so without ever making a mistake? We simply don't have the wisdom or the vision to look at the two groups and to make the responsible action. That falls unto the Lord himself. Tearing out others from the field, those who don't agree with us, will just make our field smaller and smaller. So friends, it's okay to fix a computer. It's definitely okay to paint a house. It might even be okay to modify my car. But when it comes to choosing who belongs in the kingdom and who is does not, I need to observe a hands-off policy. I simply do not have the clearness of vision to make these decisions. To judge is the Lord's jurisdiction and not mine. Let me simply welcome and let God be God. Amen. Let us join together in prayer. Lord, you know us. You know when we sit down. You know when we rise up. You know what we are thinking even before we do. You know what we are here in worship. We desire to live our lives more completely immersed in your presence. And we open our hearts to you in the time of prayer, sharing our joy, sharing our struggle, sharing our hopes for ourselves, as well as our community and our world. We pray for our world, Lord, this world that you have created and called good. We ask for your healing and your hope. To extend to those who need it the most, to those who need you this day in an important way. Lord, we pray for our state and our nation, for our leaders, that you give them wisdom and humility, for our stance in the world, give us generosity and hands that are willing to help, for our cities and towns, for our small villages and farms, 
for the remotest rural places to the most populous. Give us peace and freedom from violence, from fear. Lord, you know us. You know that we come to you in prayer with the names and faces of those with whom we have deep concern, because we know that speaking to you makes a difference, it makes a difference for them, and makes a difference for us. We pray for those who are ill or recovering. We pray for those who mourn the loss of someone dear to them. We pray for those who are going through a difficult time, overwhelmed by caretaking or addiction, through job loss or sadness, or financial pressure or other struggles. You know them, O oh Lord, all these names and all the faces. You know the next pages and chapters that will be written for them in your book. We pray for lifting of their spirits. We pray for an easing of their pain. We pray for your presence with them. That they may know that when they come to the end of the day or the end of their ability to cope, that you are there making all things possible, giving them strength and courage. Creator God, you have created each of us. You go before us, calling us to walk towards you in faithfulness and trust. You go behind us, nudging us along, prompting us to stay on the path that will lead us to peace. And so we pray for ourselves and for our needs that you alone know. O oh Lord, you know us. You know that even as we pray through the challenges that life presents, that we also remember to pray with gratitude for the joys that make all things better. You know us, Lord, you know us completely, and yet you understand, and yet you accept us and forgive us, and you promise that we are never alone, that you are with us always. And for this, we give you thanks and our praise in the name of Jesus who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, friends, may you go forth in peace, and may you have a blessed week. And may you know that the Lord is there, always encouraging, and always with you. Go in peace, friends. Amen.